to me, the real innovations and, you know, certainly humanitarian architecture are looking at that. Um, you know, how do we break down the walls between architects and the, the communities that they serve and architects and their clients and, you know, architects and the everyday? Um, you know, how do we pull architecture out of the realm of a luxury good and put it where it should be, which is, you know, an integral part of everyone's life, uh, you know, rich, poor, um, east, west, you know, all those things. How do we install it in that station? Episode 139. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Eric J. Kessel is an architect, writer, and author of the book Down Detour Road, published by MIT Press. He's also the former executive director of Architecture for Humanity. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Eric, I wanted to go back. First of all, what, one thing that impressed me, you're a very educated gentleman. <laughs> uh, I'm very schooled. How about that? Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> very schooled. So you have, a, you have an MBA. Correct. You have a, a Master's of Architecture. Mm -hmm. And you have, I think, two other graduate degrees at least, right? What, what are your other degrees? No, I have a master's in construction management um, in addition to those two, but okay. I, uh, I only have three graduate degrees. Okay, three, so, yeah. <laughs> it's as poor as that sounds. <laughs> Very, I mean, I think in terms of well-roundedness, it seems like you really hit all the, all the peaks there. Um, you know, I think there are three fields that really go together, um, and I think, you know, I did all three degrees at the same time and quite deliberately, and I feel like, you know, architecture um, touches on so many things and, you know, has a, a very um, intuitive relationship to business and construction management and sociology and, and history. And, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, I fell in love with architecture in the first place and sort of remained in love with architecture is that, you know, it does have this relationship to, um, you know, all these other fields. So, you know, it's very easy for me to intellectually integrate you know, a, a business school program with a construction management program with an architecture program. And, um, you know, my advisors and, and faculty at WashU really made that process possible by a lot of negotiations and bending over backwards on their parts. Um, so I, I still owe them a debt for that. Very cool. So does that mean that you had some negotiation in terms of kind of double fulfilling requirements and packing all that into your time there? Yeah, and just, um, you know, sort of an endless rearranging in, of schedules just to make sure that I could get all of my, you know, separate degree requirements honored. Um, I was one of two students at that time doing a triple master's. The other was Wayne Mortensen, um, the Rose Fellow and uh, formerly uh, president of AIA Associates. So I think, um, you know, the, the school was kind of testing out <laughs> the possibilities with both of us. What would you say to uh, young architects who are in school right now and thinking about doing something similar? Um, I would tell them to, to talk with their faculty, um, first of all, um, and embrace the possibilities. Uh, like I said, I think that, you know, architecture is just one of those fields that reaches into to everything um, and has, you know, a spiritual necessary relationship with art and psychology um, and a very functional and, and professional relationship with business and construction management and, and engineering. And I think that, um, you know, as the years roll on, and you know, the 20th century continues, I think people are more and more open to the idea that cross-functionality is a useful thing and the sort of hermetic specialization that characterized, you know, architecture of old um, isn't necessarily useful. Um, there's a lot of design professions out there um, that need to collaborate in order to make our cities what we want them to be. And there's a lot of competencies um, that exist in other disciplines that, you know, are entirely appropriate and at home in architecture. 
how how necessary do you think, or do you think would you recommend that architects get an MBA? Um, if they're passionate about it and they're interested in it, and you know that's why I did it because I was you know passionate about those particular issues. I think it's from the standpoint of the profession, it is absolutely necessary that you know the profession of architecture have some business literacy within it. And in that sense, I think it makes sense for you know some architects to go out and get MBAs if that's what they're you know interested in. Um, I feel equally strongly about you know literacy and philosophy and, and history um, and psychology and sociology. Mm -hmm. And I think our profession just gets richer and stronger the more diversity that we can pull in. Um, so uh, you know architects shouldn't necessarily get an MBA because they think that it's you know necessary to to run a firm. There's plenty of firm owners out there that you know run their firm just fine and, and don't have an MBA. Um, but if there are, you know, issues and questions that they find interesting and they have um, a curiosity about, you know, that side of the fence, they should absolutely go and, and do it. And I think they'll encounter a lot of support in doing so. So I figured we'd jump into your, your book here, Down D Detour Road, for the first sure. half of our conversation. And then the second half of our interview, we could jump over to what you're doing now. So let's go back in history a little bit. Tell me about you know, when you left university and you're facing the world, what were those, what were those days like for you? Uh, pretty terrible. <laughs> so let's see, uh, you know, I graduated about eight weeks after Lehman folded. So it was really just the beginning of the beginning of the recession and, you know, things were really starting to, to fall apart. And I think, um, you know, one sense because of, you know, having some finance, literacy, you know, I knew what was coming. I knew it was going to be a long, long slog. Um, you know, no one was hiring, um, you know, emotionally, intellectually, it was very frustrating to have, you know, kind of built up all these skills. And, you know, I had practiced for five years before grad school. So, you know, I had gone back to school with the intent of, you know, augmenting and supplementing the stuff that I already knew. And, in some senses, it felt like a huge step backwards. Of course, it wasn't. I mean, it was the nature of the economy, but I came out and, you know, you can't find a job pouring coffee. Um, and simultaneously, I was sort of disappointed with the profession itself, just because it seemed to sort of acquiesce to the idea that this was somehow normal, right? It was normal for architects to be unemployed in droves and, you know, what the hell, you know, these things happen, it's too bad, you know, sit it out, wait it out. And, um, you know, at the risk of sounding crude, my attitude was just, you know, fuck that. You know, architecture is an incredibly important thing socially. Um, you know, the built environment is the basis of our collective wealth, and in many cases, our personal wealth. Um, it's the first line of defense in our public health system. Um, you know, it's just a hugely important thing in this massive economic engine. And how can we say that, you know, architecture has no value, even in a recession, you know, and there's some professions that, you know, didn't suffer any sort of unemployment in the, the recession, you know, uh, the medical sector actually gained jobs during the recession. I'm sorry that I'm moving around so much. Apologies to the audience. Um, <laughs> sort of actually fidgety. Um, so, you know, I could see something similar for architecture and understanding like, hey, you know, when there's a crisis, you know, the architect is someone you call because the, the architect has, you know, a diverse set of skills and, you know, design thinking is a powerful problem solving methodology that can be, you know, applied in, in so many different ways. So, um, you know, I sort of took that angst and, and channeled it into to writing and, you know, kind of wrote out this book and said, you know, this is the world that we live in. Um, and it's one that architects can master and, you know, have a lot of fun, and produce a lot of great work and a lot of great design. Um, but here are the, the issues that I see and the, the sort of governing issues of the day. Um, and, you know, the first draft was frankly fairly angry in, in a sort of young man sort of way. Um, but I think through subsequent drafts, I got to something that was um, much more aspirational and, and optimistic. And, you know, I had a lot of support um, from friends, family, professors, um, my publisher, my editor, um, in terms of getting it where it eventually got. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, you know, it was, it was a tough year, you know, I was, I was unemployed for a year and trying to make sense of the architecture profession, um, my place in it and its place in the world. Mm. How did you survive during that year? Just financially. <laughs> By the grace of others. 
um, you know, I think I wrote the first half. I was living in my mother's basement um, and, you know, lived off a little bit of savings and, you know, the help of uh, various friends and, and relatives. Um, so I called in a lot of favors during that time, as I know many architects did. Yeah, definitely. What's the process like to get a, a publisher? I noticed this is published by the MIT Press. So what did you have to do to, you know, tell us a little bit about the process about getting a book published. Um, you know, the process for me was, uh, you know, a, a lot less glamorous than, or, or ceremonial than, than people would think. Um, you know, I, I reached out to them and I said, hey, you know, I, I've written a book about this particular subject. Would you be interested in reading it? Um, and they said yes, and uh, you know we connected, and I sent them the manuscript, and um, you know I think I benefited a lot from the timing, you know, and something I've heard over and over again over the years is you know people say, hey, you know, we really love reading the book. We've been thinking this stuff for for years. Um, so, <laughs> at the risk of sounding like false modesty, you know, I don't think I put too much original content in there. I think it was a bunch of stuff that we all sort of intuitively understood. Um, and in that sense, I think a lot of credit is to, to my publisher and my editor just for sort of flagging this, you know, I mean, I think for someone who's sort of just out of school and unemployed, um, you know, it's, it's a tough thing to, to, you know, publish a book or to expect to publish a book. And, you know, I think it was kind of a visionary move on my editor's part to even entertain the idea of, you know, reading this manuscript. But, you know, the fact is that the experiences that I talk about in that book at that time, so many of us were going through, you know, and it wasn't just young architects, it was, you know, older architects, it was people who were aspiring to be architects. I mean, we were all sort of going through this collective, you know, brutal moment in our shared history. Um, and um, like I said, you know, I benefited from the, the timing and the generosity of, uh, of others in order to get that done. Um, the conventional process for publishing a book, which I'm doing now, is much more extensive and involves sending out, um, you know, a lot of proposals and um, hitting the bricks. Uh, so it's, I, I don't want to make it sound like a simple, overly romanticized process at all. I think it's just one of those times when, you know, an author had written something that really synced up with what a lot of people were feeling and, and going through. And, um, you know, it landed in the hands of... Um, you know, a pretty insightful editor and, and managed to see the light of day. So what's different? Uh, how is the process? Why is the process different now that you're going through with your current book? Why are you going a different route than you did with uh, your first book? Um, well, the, the experiences that I'm writing about are, are very different, first of all. So, you know, the last five years of my career have been, um, you know, almost exclusively in, in post-disaster. I mean, that's where I sort of, um, you know, developed my practice is, in Haiti and, and Japan and, uh, you know, other disaster zones throughout the world. So, you know, I'm not writing about universal experiences for architects as much as I'm writing about something that very, very few architects experience. Um, so it's a very sort of, it's a sequel to the book. And, you know, there's plenty of similarities in the sense that it's still like my voice and, you know, uh, my brain farts about architecture in the world and, and everything like that. Um, but it's very, very different in the sense that instead of talking about sort of shared experiences, I'm talking about something that's, um, you know, perhaps more on the fringe of, of architectural practice. And so why go to another publisher? Um, no particular reason, um, you know, just sort of feeling it out. Um, you know, it's uh, one of those things where um, I'm writing much more deliberately now than, than I did before. Um, you know, the last book was, uh, you know, almost an accident, you know, I sort of wrote it without expectation of getting published. And, um, nowadays I make pretensions about, you know, being a writer and doing things in a more sort of conventional way. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's sort of part of the process. I guess. Yeah. So is, is it the marketing and the exposure that a traditional publisher will get you? Is that part of the reason to go that route? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think it's just sort of exploratory. I mean, there's, um, I, I think, uh, you know, marketing and exposure for, you know, an architectural author, um, you know, whatever the marketing strategies of an individual publisher might be, um, it has a lot to do with, you know, timing and what you're writing about. Um, you know, if you're writing about something that, 
you know, has uh, sort of a mass appeal, then that kind of does its own marketing. Um, so, you know, my process is different because I'm different and the mm -hmm. times are different and mm -hmm. the subject of matter is different. Um, it, it's not so much a calculated, um, you know, marketing or business decision. Mm. Eric, you know, when you're speaking about your book that you wrote here, Down Detour Road, you talk about the fact that I mean, you just mentioned that you feel like you kind of rehashed things that everyone else had already lived through their experience and it kind of resonated with people. Uh, I think you're maybe not doing the book justice. One thing that I, I do <laughs> recognize in the book is that um, the way that you present that information, I think, is really, really remarkable. Um, you have a way with prose that is, I find, rare. You know, I went to have seen a read a lot of current authors and a lot of especially architects they're writing uh, it doesn't feel like writing nowadays is as highly esteemed as it was in the past mm -hmm. and people being able actually to have a very high level of, of articulation in the written word you know weave in stories weave in examples metaphors similes uh, you seem to do that second nature in the book so I'm just curious uh, where that comes from what was your training in writing and why do you think that um, that you have that talent um well, thanks. I'm not sure if the camera can pick up my blushing, but um, I, I have no training in writing other than, you know, being, a, you know, a reader and being a fan of the English language and, and books. I would say that the, the, the style of the book was very much born of my frustration with, you know, the books on architecture that I've read. Um, and, you know, part of the point of the book is that, you know, architects should be accessible. Right. I mean, I think real genius takes, um, you know, complicated things and makes them simple. And that's why we revere, you know, people like, uh, you know, Carl Sagan and, and Einstein and Beethoven that can kind of take these extraordinarily complex uh, concepts and sort of make them accessible to us, you know. And, uh, you know, I listen to the, the second movement of, uh, you know, Beethoven's Seventh Symphony and I just get sad. And like, that's like the saddest piece of music that's ever been written and you know it's just it's it's amazing that someone is able to do that and i think too often you know when we're talking about architecture we take simple things and we try and make them complicated because we think that it enhances their value or that um you know it somehow makes us look better or, or something like that um i think you know profession-wide you know every architect could stand to do a better job of you know making what we do more understandable and more intelligible to you know, a wider audience and, you know, showing people why architecture makes sense and why, you know, good design is good value and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, in writing the book, um, you know, I couldn't afford to be pretentious. Um, you know, I was a 31 year old unemployed person living in my mom's basement. I mean, <laughs> it wouldn't have like come off very well. Um, but I think also it's, you know, sort of fundamental philosophical commitment to um, not necessarily writing well, but writing simply. Um, and perhaps those two things go together more often than, than their opposites. But, um, yeah, you know, I tried to write, you know, simple and direct and, and say what I meant to say without kind of overly complicating it. Gotcha. I'd like to read a, a little excerpt from the book. Sure. It'd be a little weird for you to have it read back to you, but I'd like to just <laughs> give our audience a, a taste for what the book is like. You talk about leaving uh, grad school. Uh, some some potent imagery here, talking about um, the wet street, the darkness, sheets of freezing rain, definitely painting a picture of kind of a somber atmosphere. You know, yeah. kind of wondering what I do next. And you said, my father lives in the way, way out. He has one visible neighbor, and that neighbor has one visible building, a greenhouse of corrugated plastic. Interesting, your writing style too. So, just for our readers, there's a period there. So, you know, grammatically, that would be a, a fragment, but it's sort of train of thought. Uh, interesting mm. the way you're, you're writing here. The sun was setting over my left shoulder, and its purple and pink rays were getting caught in the corrugation of the plastic. Every panel captured the light differently. The strong wind must have been oil canning the panels because the surface of the building shimmered organically like bright rocks under moving water. The building was alive by pure accident. Perhaps it was just post-finals delirium, but I found myself entranced by this simple greenhouse. I had spent the better part of the last 10 years seeking out architecture, trying to understand it, to define it, to make it, and in some way capture it in shipboard and styrene. Driving back across the country, I was possessed by the thought that I had failed in those efforts. Not only could I not find architecture in what I was doing, 
I couldn't find architecture in what anyone else was doing. So that's an excerpt from the book Down T Detour Road. Eric, tell me about that last thought there, uh, what you meant by that. I couldn't find architecture in um, what I was doing, and I couldn't find it in what anyone else was doing. Well, I mean, I think that's a reference to, um, you know, the sort of idea of high architecture that, you know, gets explored later in the book. And it's this notion that, you know, architecture with a capital A is what happens in the pages of the magazines that we all read. Um, it's what happens in the academy. It's what happens in the awards ceremony. And I think, you know, that, that anecdote happened to be true. Uh, my dad did have one neighbor and there was this, you know, greenhouse that, you know, had this kind of weird shimmering effect on it. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we so often miss, you know, and that there's architecture with a lowercase a that's out there and it's beautiful and, you know, no one knows who designed it. Um, it'll never show up in a magazine. Um, but you can take examples like that from your life and, you know, use that as a vehicle to talk to people about why, you know, design is important and why architecture is important. And I think that, you know, there's there's beauty in the everyday. And, you know, so often we get sort of trapped by this notion that, you know, in order to be architecture, um, you know, it's got to show up, you know, at the awards ceremony, it's got to be in the magazine, it's got to be by, you know, someone with a, a famous name or, or something like that. And um, my ambitions are wider, you know, like I want to see beautiful architecture in my everyday life. And, you know, part of that means that we go out and make more architecture. I think another part of it is that we open our eyes, you know, to the architecture around us. So I think that was the, the, the impetus, the, the sort of spirit behind the story and the angst that I was feeling at that time. Tell me about since then till now, what is your, how has your uh, definition of architecture changed and where, where do you find it? Um, you know, I, working in disaster, I think I've come to appreciate architecture much more as a process rather than, you know, a product. And, you know, we've, we sort of understand architecture as like a building, right? And like the building is completed and you take pictures of it. And, you know, at that point it becomes architecture. Um, for me, like the architecture is really in, in the process itself. And, you know, how does one engage a community? How does one um, translate one's personal, you know, philosophical, spiritual values into, um, you know, a life's practice, you know, a way of life? How does how do we translate who we are into what we do? Um, you know, all of these questions are extremely interesting to me. And, and I think, you know, through my experience in disaster, I've come to understood, understand that, you know, the product is an inevitable uh, outcome of the process and everything that I just mentioned. So, you know, rather than getting fixated on, you know, what does the eventual product look like? And, you know, I got to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go take pictures of the building because the light's just right and da da da. Um, if you do everything right throughout the process, the product takes care of itself, right? And, you know, I'm reminded of that quote by Bucky Fuller where, you know, he says, you know, I never set out to do anything beautiful. You know, I set out to, you know, answer the question and, you know, I forget exactly what he says, do so efficiently and da 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 da. Um, if in the end the product is not beautiful, I know that the process was was messed up, right? I know I made some mistake in the process. And I think to me, the real innovations and, you know, certainly humanitarian architecture are looking at that. Um, you know, how do we break down the walls between architects and the, the communities that they serve and architects and their clients and, you know, architects and the everyday? Um, you know, how do we pull architecture out of the realm of a luxury good and put it where it should be, which is, you know, an integral part of everyone's life, uh, you know, rich, poor, uh, east, west, you know, all those things. How do we install it in that station? Does that answer your question or is that a little too esoteric? That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, in the book, I'd like to come back here in the book, you talk about, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of architects. I, I highly recommend everyone who get this. You should definitely read uh, this you'll you'll chuckle. There's a little passage here I highlighted talking about your job search, and you know we all know those familiar alerts off of Monster.com. You know, seeing right. the jobs that are available. <laughs> and you said here humorously, at any rate, there were no jobs for architect as I understood that term. It occurred to me because you were getting all sorts of you know um, results for database architect, yeah. solutions architect. Still do. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you say it, you write, at any rate, there were no jobs for architect as I understood that term. It occurred to me that over the last generation, while a bunch of smart people anguished over the distinction between architect and designer and in- intern architect or interior architect, someone stole our damn name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, def- I, I definitely pick up a little bit of subtle, subtle anger there. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, back to my point about, you know, these being some universal themes. I mean, I think that's something that's bothered every architect at some point. Um, you know, the process for becoming an architect is so rigorous and, you know, requires such a commitment and so many years of training and everything like that. And the reward at the end of that is supposed to be being able to call oneself an architect. Um, and what kind of reward is it if, you know, anybody off the street can just pick up the name and start calling themselves um, an architect? And, you know, frankly, I think our profession has done a, a pretty miserable job of protecting the name um, and, you know, making it clear in the minds of, you know, John Q. Public what that really means and what it infers about the individual who carries it. Um, I think that's, it's an important word and we may not ever be able to get it back. I'm not suggesting that there's some sort of, you know, initiative or program that could sort of uh, correct this uh, even over a period of time. Um, But I think it's worth something being bothered about and worth thinking about, you know, as we move forward in the future. You know, how we define the word architect is um, cultural, it's spiritual, it's individual, Um, but at least in some senses, it's also legal and and professional. And, you know, if we give up that last part, I think the the first part's become so much harder. Hmm. For for foreign listeners, just want to clarify, in the United States, uh, state by state, the word architect is a protected term. If you're practicing mm-hmm. the, the field of architecture, you have to be registered or licensed with your state board to use that term. You've traveled a lot, Eric, um, all over the world. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious, what do you see about the regu- the way that term is regulated in other nations? What are you seeing out there? How are other countries doing it? Well, um, it's an extremely interesting question. I actually touch on it in, in my new book a little bit. The um, you know, if you trace how, you know, the term architect was professionalized and legalized in the United States, you know, you can sort of pin just about, you know, every country on, you know, some sort of U.S. historical timeline, right? And you can say that, um, you know, in the, the 1870s in the United States, um, you know, the term architect referred to a generalist, you know, someone who was, you know, an artist and could draw and could manage construction and, you know, do all these things. Um, And there's still, you know, many places on earth where that's, you know, sort of assumed um, is that, you know, the architect has some construction management role, um, you know, essentially an owner's representative and and that sort of thing. Um, You know, I've also been in places where that term essentially does not exist. Um, You know, it's not in wide currency. Um, I think, you know, the, the answer, a full answer to your question would be extensive because, you know, a lot of different countries do it a lot of different ways. And I don't think that there's necessarily one right way to do it. You know, I've never been in any place where, um, you know, I've seen a system and said, oh, my God, that makes perfect sense. That's the best system. I think it's more about cultivating a system that makes sense for, you know, that time and and that place. Um, You know, a lot of countries confer that title upon graduation from architecture school. Um, You know, I'm not sure that that's a solution and I'm not sure that's an answer. I do know that, you know, our present system of having sort of untitled professionals for 10 years, you know, in the profession is completely dysfunctional um, and calling them interns is an insult, although it sounds like NCARB has finally admitted that, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's important to kind of keep talking about these things and, and to be aware of the fact that, you know, there are other models out there and that, you know, the, the process is ultimately what we make it. Um, you know, we can shape it however we want. Um, and in fact, we did, right? Starting in 1897, you know, when architects were first licensed in the United States, um, you know, we sort of endeavored to say, okay, this is what an architect is. And, you know, this is what his or her qualifications are going to be. And this is the process that's going to regulate that. And da, da, da. I mean, it's not some, you know, external process set down in stone tablets somewhere. I mean, it's just, it's what we make it. Um, and I don't think any architect should rest on their laurels about, you know, what it is or, or their satisfaction with it. In the, in the book, you talk about different 
archetypes I would maybe say for architects. One of them is the idea architect. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Um, what is the yeah. idea architect? I actually haven't read the book in a couple of years. But, <laughs> um, so the idea architect, um, from what I recall, you know, was sort of poking at you know a fundamental contradiction within architecture, and I think that um, architects maintain a lot of sort of cultural quirks. Um, which I think merit examination is one of the reasons I wrote the book. And one of these is, you know, the willingness to give away ideas. Um, and we live in an idea economy. You know, we've got an entire office of the U.S. government that, you know, regulates patents. Um, you know, all these new exciting billionaires are always out, you know, uh, you know, developing ideas. And, you know, I'm formerly a resident of San Francisco. The entire city is just like young designers with like app and product ideas that, you know, are going to go out there. And I think, uh, you know, architects, for some strange reason, are, are cultured into an idea, into a, an ethos that seems to, to be all right with giving that away, right? And, you know, I pull out competitions as the, the sort of foremost and most uh, ubiquitous example of architects being way, willing to give away their time, give away their talent, devalue themselves, devalue the, the process of architecture and the profession of architecture. And I think there's a fundamental dysfunction there where, you know, architects, well, for one thing, you know, they're willing to trade economic capital for cultural capital, but perhaps more cynically, they believe that those two are irreconcilable or mutually exclusive. Um, you know, I think it's possible to, to want that cultural capital and want that, you know, recognition and want your name out there and your designs out there, but also want the money, you know, like you don't have to split those things apart. And I think we need to talk about how we grow a profession where those things kind of go hand in hand and I'm willing to bet that you know there's not an architect in your audience that hasn't at one point taken that one job that they knew was going to be a loser they're going to lose money on it but it's at you know a very visible intersection in their city so they know they get a lot of recognition or you know it's a, a very notable client so they get a lot of great press off of it and you know we develop this sort of culture of giving away free content um, I think the only circumstances where that's appropriate to do so, ironically, are, are, you know, in my area of the woods, which is, you know, humanitarian architecture. And I think when people are really suffering, yeah, okay, so you go and, like, give your time away because people need your help. Um, but why are you going to give your time away, your talent away, um, you know, for the benefit of, the, you know, some rich developer or, or something like that? And I think these are things that are cultured very, very early in the process. That is, you know, going back to architecture school, you know, architectures or architects are, are sort of inculcated to this, you know, idea of, you know, the greatest reward that I can have is recognition and appreciation of my design intent and my design ability. Um, and, you know, at best, I can, you know, forego the economic rewards. And at worst, those economic rewards actually compromise my integrity as an architect or, or as an artist. So, I mean, I think these are silly ideas, you know, I mean, there's plenty of arts, art, artists out there that get paid a lot of money and they develop, you know, economic structures to market and sell their work. And you shouldn't necessarily feel that those two things are irreconcilable. And, and architects, uh, architecture is a strange bird, you know, and that like, it seems to be the only profession where this goes on, where people go through, 10 years of training and you know have this enormous creative capability and you know go out and through you know these hard hard won skills design these beautiful things and then just give them away you know um i've never really understood it and i still don't hmm. it brings to mind when i uh when i interviewed tom main here on business of architecture uh, i started out by telling him you know uh ask him a little about that and he kind of at the beginning of the interview, he kind of chuckled and he said, "Business." He kind of, he's all, "Do you know anything about my work?" <laughs> and I, I think his I think his inference was that the things that Tom tries to stand for are inherently not tied to business, but they're supposedly they stand alone. They're artistic interpretations, you know, very much the gentleman architect where money is it seemed like a dirty thing. But on the other hand, you know, in my experience with this organization, behind the scenes of Morphosis is a very well oiled business enterprise. Uh, that runs well, and there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of business stuff that happens in the background. So it almost feels a little bit j disingenuous to me um, to have uh, to have that image portrayed in one hand of the architect who won't touch money. On the other hand, behind the scenes where no one really is aware of it, there's this 
promotion and marketing machine going on that's, you know, practicing the best practices in, in business. And that that's what allows that architect to be able to get the exposure, to be able to get the projects and, and have the impact. Well, I would agree with all that, except for the, you know, behind the scenes where no one knows about it. The truth is everybody knows about it. Everybody who runs a firm or is a firm principal is aware that, you know, an architecture firm is a business. Is it a business that's incapable of producing true art? No, absolutely not. I and mean, we see that, you know, all the time. You kind of open up any magazine and you'll see, uh, you know, amazing pieces, amazing artistic creations, uh, amazing design, you know, coming out of the field. Um, that is, you know, sympathetic with and supported by, you know, the sort of business thinking that's, you know, going on at, at the firm. Um, you know, I think you're you're right when you say it's a cultural idea. You know, it's it's you know almost the sort of Howard Roark mythology that we continue to keep alive for for some reason. And I think that um, you know one of my central ambitions for the profession would really be um, deconstructing some of these myths um, and. You know, I have two advanced degrees in management and I spent my whole career in the humanitarian field, you know. I mean, it's not a dirty word to, you know, do management um, and I certainly have no objections to people wanting to go out and make money. Um, it's never really been <laughs> part of my plan, but, um, you know, who knows, maybe someday. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the sort of, we've got some cultural work to do in terms of understanding that. Um, you know, being a great artist and, you know, being a great uh, marketer and being a great business person, these are not irreconcilable things. And you don't have to look very far. Look at the damn art community. Look at Damien Hirst. Um, I don't think anybody would accuse him of being a bad business person. You know, I mean, he's probably one of the best there is and, you know, should be in the Fortune 500. In fact, I think he may be. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think it's it's a process of sort of collective cultural self-re-education, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. What are your thoughts for how we go about changing that paradigm? Um, I mean, you've got to start in the schools, right? Um, because it's kind of fundamentally a process of cultural education. And I think we devalue the schools when we think about schools as just a place where you go to learn how to design or, you know, learn some piece of technical knowledge like, uh, you know, drawing a wall section or something like that. I think schools are also where we culturally educate architects and, you know, we teach young people, in some cases very, very young people, um, you know, what architects care about. Um, how to talk like an architect, how to walk like an architect, how to dress like an architect. Um, you know, it is a process of cultural education. Um, I think one of the severely limiting things in our profession is the disconnect between um, you know, the academy and the profession, and it gets cartoonish at times, you know, with, uh, you know, people in the academy throwing rocks at the profession and saying, uh, you know, oh, that's not architecture, it's, you know, crass commercialism. And then, you know, the, the people in the profession throw rocks at the academy and say, oh, you know, that's kind of goofy, like head in the clouds, like nonsense, you know, you got to get out here and, uh, you know, practice real architecture. Um, and, you know, I still remember, you know, my, my first job out of undergrad, I went and they said, okay, you know, forget about school. We're going to teach you how to be a real architect. And then I went back to school and they said, all right, well, forget about all that stuff. We're going to teach you how to be a real architect. And then I finished grad school and it's like, okay, well, forget everything you learned in grad school. It's time to, you know, I mean, it's just, it's silly at some point. Um, so I think the first thing is, you know, to take a step back and, you know, infuse ourselves with a little bit of uh, mutual respect, uh, you know, for other people in the profession that, maybe practicing in a different way. And I don't think the fact that someone who's an architect chooses to teach makes them less of an architect. Um, and I think we can also take a step back and recognize that, again, architecture is a strange bird. Like, this is not the way that it works in, in most professions. In most professions, there's a virtuous cycle, you know, a loop where, you know, the academy is the place where, you know, more radical ideas are tested and filtered in you know, an environment that does not have the consequence of clients, right? You know, I can design something without worrying about, you know, getting my ass suit off, uh, you know, if it doesn't work. And then, you know, those ideas sort of filtering up into the profession, the profession then being a secondary testing ground where we understand, okay, this makes a lot of sense and this works and we're going to sort of adopt it as a, a static model. Um, but this doesn't. So, you know, let's kind of go back to the academy and refine this idea and, and that sort of thing. In real tactical terms, I think, you know, our profession could 
uh, change dramatically if every architect who is, you know, constantly, you know, wailing about the, the academy um, and how all the, you know, sort of new graduates show up not knowing anything, uh, if that person would take a little time out of their schedule and go and teach a class at their local university. And, you know, I think if large numbers of architects made that commitment to the profession, you could see a sea change in the way the academy and the profession really work together. Have you thought about starting your own practice, or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a -a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.